Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Heritage Talks Online. My name is Heather Darch, and I'm here with my colleague, Glenn Patterson, and we are project directors for the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network, also known as Quan. Thank you very much for joining our series today called Dreaming Big, inspiring stories from across Quebec's heritage community. In this series, we've been exploring the inspiring stories coming from our heritage organizations, community groups, cultural organizations, museums, and archives, and exploring what their impact has been to the history and heritage of Quebec. Quan is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to preserve, protect, and promote the history and heritage of Quebec, and in particular of Quebec's English speaking communities spread right across the province. You're welcome to become a member of Quan, and membership is open to everyone, including community groups and heritage organizations. And to find out more about us, you can go to our website at qahn.org for more information. Membership gives you access to all sorts of great publications, information about research being conducted across the network, events taking place, uh, all kinds of activities going on, museum exhibitions and that sort of thing, and also to our publication called Quebec Heritage News. It's a great publication written by historians and history enthusiasts from right across the province. And this is included in your membership four times a year. So if you'd like to become a member of Quan and receive our great publication and become a part of our great network, you can do so very easily. And today we actually have a special membership discount, 30% off, that's $20 for a one year membership. And if you're interested, you can send us a note during this broadcast on the chat button that's at the bottom of the Zoom page if you're on Zoom with us, or send us a note on Facebook, and we'll tell you how you can go about taking advantage of our special discount promotion. I'd like to thank our funders who make this series possible, including Canadian Heritage, the Zeller Family Foundation, the Chalkers Foundation, and the Townshippers Foundation. If you're interested, you can see all of our broadcasts from the series. They are located on our Heritage Talks Facebook page because this is all being recorded. And you don't have to have a Facebook page of your own. You can simply go to the Heritage Talks Facebook page and there you'll see the entire lineup from the, the series from this year and also from last. And we're almost at the end of the series so you can still see the up and coming promotions there for the talk still to come. Now I'll take a moment to introduce you to Glenn, my colleague, and he has a little bit of a instruction for you about managing Zoom and Facebook today. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Heather. Welcome, everyone. Uh, indeed, I'm here to help uh, if you need it uh, on the tech side. So if you're on Zoom, um, your best friend is the chat box. That's down in the bottom of the computer window if you're using um, a laptop or a PC. Um, otherwise, if you're on a mobile device like a smartphone and you're using Zoom, you may need to tap the screen once to see the chat box. And you can either address a question um, to myself or you can um, address it to everyone. We're all friends here. Um, other than that, uh, if you're on Facebook, any technical difficulties, there's not much I can do on Facebook. We don't control that, but leave a comment if uh, if you're experiencing any any issues there. Um, I think you would have seen a, a message when you joined this call on Zoom that it's being recorded and live streamed. If you're uncomfortable with that and you're here on Zoom with us, you're most welcome to leave the call and just hop on over to our Facebook Live page, uh, Quan Heritage Talks, and you can just uh, partake there. You can leave questions for the speakers there as well in the chat box, but otherwise you're most welcome to stay. So that's everything I have. Heather, back to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Glenn. Well, our speakers today are Pamela Anderson and Barb Amston from Heritage Lower St. Lawrence. Pam Anderson is the community coordinator and keeper of the Métis Historical Society archives and has been the heart and soul of Heritage Lower St. Lawrence for its 20 year existence. In 2007, she initiated the first of the now annual Remembrance Weeks, building awareness of the sacrifices of those who served and serve. Participants include Rimouski, Montjoli, and Matin Legion representatives 
veterans, students, and guests from all levels of government. The Community Memorial, a dream Pam shared with many in the community, is now a reality. Barb Amston is the past Heritage Lower St. Lawrence board member. She's a volunteer project lead for Heritage Lower St. Lawrence's Memorial and Live Our Heritage Projects. As great-great-granddaughter of Scottish immigrant stonemason come sugar magnate John Redpath, she regrets not inheriting his wealth due to his multitude of offspring. However, as the family record keeper, she is exceedingly proud of great-great-aunt Julia Drummond, head of the London Canadian Red Cross Information Bureau, and Julia's five Beauvais nieces and nephews who gave in different ways during World War I. Their talk this afternoon is called Lighting the Torch, How a Memorial <sighs> Dream Came True in Métis-sur-Mer. Hello to you both and welcome to Heritage Talks Online. Hello. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon and welcome to you all. My name is Pamela Anderson and this is my associate Barb Hampston. Today we will be speaking to you about the Memorial Wall project called The Torch. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Heather and Glenn because really they do make it very easy and I echo the it's a good idea to join uh, Quan. I also want to welcome all of those others. I've seen some of the names, so it uh, it makes us feel very good to see um, many people from the community in Matisse. Um, I'm going to admit that this pro oops sorry I'm going to admit that this project um, became that much more important for us uh, as we worked on it over the past couple of months because of uh, what we are seeing in the Ukraine. Um, it was different countries. Whoops. 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 <laughs> okay. Oops. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, it's different country. It was different countries in World War II, but it's it's terrible to think that we are witnessing this kind of destruction again. Um, now we're going to talk about some of the people on the front lines and on the home front uh, from the past uh, for World War One, World War Two, and and more. And we're also going to talk about how we went about getting funding. Um, maybe a moment or two of despair, uh, but why we're glad that obviously we kept going with this. So over to you, Pam. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm gonna have to not do this. There we go, there we go. So a little bit about Heritage Lower St. Lawrence. It was founded in 2000 by the Association Social Cultural, the Matisse and incorporated on April 12, 2002, under part two of the Canadian Corporations Act under the name Heritage Lower St. Lawrence, Heritage Basie Laurent. Heritage Lower St. Lawrence supports, promotes, preserves, and helps develop services in the English speaking residents living in the Lower St. Lawrence between La Pocatere to Cap Shaw. Heritage is based in Matisse-sur-Mer and is a non for profit organization. I was employed in 2002 by Heritage and worked in a small office at the Matisse Beach School. And at that time, I was what you would call jack of all trades for the organization. Matisse-sur-Mer, uh, you jumped ahead. <laughs> Go back one, Barb. <laughs> Matisse-sur-Mer is situated on the south shore of the scenic Gaspé coast in the lower St. Lawrence region and is approximately 400 miles northeast of Montreal and about 200 miles from Quebec City. And at this point, the river widens to 40 miles distance across the St. Lawrence to the north shore. Matisse is one of the oldest and most widely known resorts in Quebec within a established reputation. The population of Matisse-sur-Mer is approximately 380 year-round residents and there are fewer than 80 Anglophone families living here during the winter months. But during the summer months, the population swells to 2,000 plus Anglophone speaking families 
that come from Quebec and outside Quebec to make Matisse their home. The Anglophones have always lived in a friendly and peaceful way with the French speaking residents for generations. Many of the descendants of the founding family still reside here today. And it is interesting to note that with over 200 years of proud heritage behind them, the community still thrives. The life of the English speaking Matisse communities tight knitted and they still maintain their mother tongue and religion. They rely on each other and have strong values, traditions and memories that continue to bind the families and the community together. Next. <laughs> I would attend meetings and events and my first Remembrance Day, November 11th service was in 2002 at the Matisse Beach School where the children, teachers and some invited veterans from town came to a ceremony outside on a very cold day. It wasn't until 2006 that Heritage Lower St. Lawrence along with Matisse Beach School teacher, Kathy Dotson decided that we should apply for funding from Canadian Veterans Affairs so that more could be done for the veterans and also to have more involvement with the school children and the community. <clears throat> the next slides have a connection of World War II with Matisse. <laughs> they served on the the World War II brought the war in Europe much cl too close to for comfort here in Canada. From Canadian Encyclopedia, the Battle of the St. Lawrence was an extension of a larger battle of the Atlantic. The German campaign during the Second World War was to disrupt shipping from North America to the United Kingdom. Between 1942 and 1944, German submarines, U-boats, repeatedly penetrated the waters of the St. Lawrence River and Gulf, sinking 22 freighters and costing hundreds of lives. It was the first time since the War of 1812 that naval battles were waged in Canadian inland waters. Closer to home, here in Matisse, six miles offshore, on October 8, 1942, the merchant ship SS Carlos was torpedoed and was sunk by U-boat 69. 11 men ages 16 to 42 were killed. The 16 year old young man came from Verdun in Montreal and his name was John Millamine. They served in the air. <clears throat> During the second world war, many more pilots were going to be needed and they needed planes to be trained in a safe place far from large populations. In 1939, Prime Minister Mackenzie King had a dream, which he believed was a sign of the power of the airplane in determining ultimate victory in the war. That dream became a reality in the form of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Just 20 minutes from Matisse in the town of Marjolie, which became a training facility for number nine bombing and gunning school. And it provided instructions to air observer, observers, Bob Amers and wireless gun, air gunners in the techniques of their trades. By the end of 1941, Canada was already an established epicenter for British and Commonwealth flight training, spitting out trained airmen in as little as six months. But at this time, accidental deaths during training, as well as knowing that the bomber crews only had a 25% chance of surviving the first 30 missions was the reality. Barb. Barb? 
It's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Go you. back. Go yeah, back no, once. I know. It's just to with the audience. I do apologize. Uh, the this is moving ahead. <laughs> the slides are moving ahead without me wanting them to. So I apologize for the the jerkiness, and we'll try to. The other uh, story. I have an idea, Barb. Actually, yeah. um, why don't you try try stop your um PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. I suspect there might be some kind of autoplay feature on it, so I That's would just it. stop yeah. it. Yeah, I would just stop it, then just start from the. Let me just look at your screen there. Uh, use take out that use timings. Yeah, it was basically it was probably advancing on like you know every forty seconds or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think that probably did it. So go to from beginning again, then find your slide, and you should be good. Okay. Let's hope. Fingers crossed. Okay, I'm sorry for the audience, though. It's not the best way to watch it. Okay, and here we go. Okay, um, so I wanted to we wanted to highlight one of the pilots uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, we had to make a decision at the beginning of the project about who we are going to include and, and enlist as having served in one of the world wars. And so we decided in the end, because there is an interesting link between the Anglophone and the Francophone, between the, um, the permanent residents and those that just come from summer. So we wanted to be as inclusive as possible. And so we did include all those categories. But there was one person, uh, basically the summer residents who consider themselves to be Matesian at heart. Uh, one of the people was not Canadian born and nor was he in the Canadian military. Uh, Tony Bethel married into Matisse, which uh, could be a very brave thing to do because uh, it's an unusual place. Uh, and he'd been with the British Royal Air Force. Why we wanted to mention him here was that he was a survivor of the Great Escape. I think pretty much most of the people on this, um, uh, on this Zoom or on Facebook will have heard of the Great Escape, but if not, there is a great movie about it. And uh, there is something on the website where you can listen to his wife talking about uh, what he was what he was doing at this time. Oops, sorry, Pam. Huh. Yeah. Component of what is known today as part of the Canadian Armed Forces, and it's the largest element. While many see only big artillery and tanks when thinking of those who fought on land, the roles of people in the army range and still range considerably. The army produces soldiers who are well-trained, well-equipped, well-led, and ready for operations at home and abroad. Our soldiers protect Canadians in the interest in many ways. Many families saw not just one, but many family members, male and female, involved in some way in the war efforts over the years. And a list of over 275 men and women's names have been identified in Matisse and surrounding areas okay. in the Lower St. Lawrence region. Heritage archives contain information about soldiers connected with the Lower St. Lawrence from as long ago as the mid 19th century. <clears throat> Barb? So, so, yeah, in our research, we discovered two people had been awarded Victoria Crosses with links to our area. Uh, one of them at, at the Victoria Cross, for those unfamiliar with it, is for uh, conspicuous bravery. And uh, the two were Jean Briand from Routierville and Joseph Keeble from Samoese, which are both less than 100 kilometers away from Matisse. Sadly, both of them lost their lives. So what now, what sparked this idea of a memorial tribute? In 2003, I had received an email from a family living in England who were searching and wanting a photo of a family member buried at the Matisse Beach Cemetery from World War II. The young man was killed in the training accident at Mojali. This email had a profound effect on me, and I felt sorry for the family who lived so far away and had never seen the grave of their loved one. As well for me, thinking about the young 16-year-old youth from the SS Carlos John Millamine. And lastly, the veterans who have talked to me over the years and mentioned 
that they felt forgotten and unappreciated. As the years went by, and with the death of many veterans each year, the famous words of Martin Luther King's, I have a dream that one day rung in my ears, and I wanted something to remember and honor these men and women, as well as I always wanted the community, the children, and the veterans to be connected and have their input in the Remembrance Week activities. I first met Barb when I invited her to come to a history meeting that I held. Barb became interested in what I was doing at Heritage, and she also became a board member for Heritage. And at this point, she asked me what projects would I like to do in 2019? And she came on board with my dream. And this is how the Memorial Wall, the torch became, project came about. I now hand it over to Barb Abston, who will explain the process of our dream. Thanks, Pam. Um, so from what Pam had told me, uh, okay, um, she told me that Matisse doesn't just set, recognize Remembrance Day. They have activities for an entire Remembrance Week each year, and kids and veterans are involved, and there's always new information and new memorabilia for um, from the area, and, you know, people will bring it back um, with them from you know, where they live to share it with people in the community, which is, I find pretty good. Um, the week before Remembrance Day week, uh, volunteers put flags out from the UK, New Zealand and Australia each year on the graves of the foreign airmen that, whose graves you saw on the last slide. Uh, as well, they also put them in the, the on the graves of Canadian, Canadian flags on the military graves at Baie des Sables, uh, and Les Boules Catholic Cemetery and the Matisse United and Leggett's Presbyterian Cemeteries. Pam and a friend also went to the neighboring towns of Saint-Octave, Padoue and Price uh, because people were interested in following that same tradition. So we do kind of do outreach uh, quite a distance now. And I think there was somebody that came from over 100 kilometers away uh, to at least one of the, present uh, one of the ceremonies that uh, Pam was talking about. So veterans are sharing their ideas, their items, and there are uh, veterans that come from Rabouski and Maljoli, Matan and Matisse. And after the ceremony uh, itself, the children will serve lunch, hand out handmade items to the uh, veterans to thank them for their service. So it keeps growing in numbers with a dip, obviously, over the past two years. Um, but we're hoping to get it back up and uh, at the same uh, numbers that it was in the past, which was, I think, over 400, if I recall. So there were two other reasons that kind of that kind of uh, called to me, let's say. Um, two things happened at the same time. One was there was a multi-sensory touring exhibition, War Flowers, which happened to be showing at the Jardin de Matisse. So for those of you that want to come to the area, there's always there's also the Jardin de Matisse or Reefer Gardens, beautiful uh, gardens. Um, and this exhibit uh, was the basis for, um, it was based on flowers that were picked by Canadian soldier George Cantley, who spent time in Matisse himself, uh, as he walked past fields in the World War I, and he would press them and send them in letters to his daughter, his baby daughter, Celia, in Montreal. So they were always positive letters. And there were other members of the Matisse community in the exhibition itself, which I had not been aware of so many of these people. Um, and also it shows, uh, it has the images and the sounds of war and also the smells of war, which makes it the multi-sensory, was shown in different parts of Canada later and in Europe. And I ended up overhearing two Francophone accountants uh, that were going around it and were just amazed by the exhibit uh, because they had essentially not been taught about World War I in school. So that kind of confirmed Pam's idea and what she'd heard from the veterans that a lot of people don't know about it. I guess I'm just getting old too fast. I just assume everybody knows about it. Uh, the second was we had a call from Glenn Miller, who's a retired warrant officer from Alberta, and he was looking for information on the guns of Mons. Mons was where the last shots of World War I were fired and the first deaths of that war had occurred there. He was asking for, uh, this is Glenn Miller, was asking for my information about my great uncle, Wilfred Bovey, who I hadn't known had had the honor of representing the Canadian Expeditionary Force 
uh, at the end or after the war to present the guns to the town of Mons after Canadians had played such a crucial role in liberating Belgium and other parts. So these two things kind of combined and clearly it was meant to be. So, okay. Uh, so in 2019, I had helped Heritage apply for a grant for a project called Live Our Heritage. And one part of that was trails. And along the trails, uh, you could read about the different people, the different houses, different styles, et cetera. And we wanted one to be a mem the memorial. We also knew that 2020 was gonna be the 75th anniversary of World War II. And finally, um, we, uh, sorry, uh, we also knew <laughs> that there was a commemorative partnership program which gave amounts of money up to $25,000 um, for uh, creating um, memorials or monuments. So luckily we had a, a new, what well, Pam has knowledge, and then we had a new executive di director, Alain Latulipe, who was very good. He was a former diplomat, so he knew all about working under pressure and was fluently bilingual and helped us word the proposal and get it in on time because Pam, on these last few days, she had uh, a daughter getting married, which we think we gave her time off to go to go see that. Anyways, on February the 28th, we submitted our proposal. And on February 28th, that same day, the first COVID-19 case in Quebec was announced. So this ended up having a much greater role than we expected in this whole exercise. So now we had sent the proposal. So we had some period to wait. We knew while the, um, while the proposal was evaluated. So the who is we knew we needed community involvement. That's something that the, uh, this commemorative program of the federal government requires. And our mayoress, um, uh, Caroline Dubé was great. She was on side. Uh, we knew where our Pam had already figured out where she wanted it placed and she had discussed it. So it was at the town hall. So that's the kind of the red circle that you see. Um, and then uh, we knew also, sorry, but that one of the problems was, well, this looks like a lovely picture and it is. When we had to actually do this, it was uh, February and it was snowing and we, it was very you know, impossible to take measurements and do all of the things we wanted to do. So that uh, we kind of recreated the wall later on in the summer and adjusted the measurements. So what it was, was Pam came up with the idea of a memory wall. And rather than smooth surfaces, we proposed using sandbags because they were rough. They were the, they, and they also best symbol, symbolized the uh, harsh uh, conditions that the soldiers endured, endured. And it was the bulwark of protection that they had and just as we have um, from our uh, military service men and women today. We both liked the idea of a poppy, so we added a big stone in the middle from the area and we wanted to put a big a glass poppy on it that's a bit kind of unusual. And it would be protected by the two protective wings. And we also had to find a name for it. And as Pam has mentioned, um, it, it is the torch or le flambeau. And it came from the poem by a Canadian doctor, John McRae, you would have heard of, and to you, from failing hands we throw, the torch be yours to hold it high. Luckily, as you could see, Veteran Affairs did not take marks off for my very poor drawing, um, because they do under, I mean, you can't, we didn't want to go into debt to create something if we weren't going to get the money. Okay, so we've sent in the proposal. Uh, but what can we do? And so rather than uh, keeping the fires burning, we were actually more banking them, sort of, you know, keeping the embers going because we couldn't do too much. So uh, what happened was we didn't formally, yeah, we couldn't formally announce, but Pam approached two Legion members, um, Marc-André Guilbeault and uh, Roger Tremblay, who were both great. And so they helped us kind of get going with some of the details. Um, she also, Pam also spoke with Caroline Dubé, and so we were working, um, but we couldn't really go to the council um, until, again, we had something to present. Um, the uh, Veterans Affairs Canada came back with some questions, you know, was it going to be public land or private land? They also came back with a booklet of conservation and construction guidelines that it would have been useful to have when we put the proposal together, but it was still good. We put, um, it, we had to include lighting and a variety of other things, but those things we were able to deal with. 
We also had a, a gentleman in the area um, who was um, that tried to build a, or make construct a uh, cement um, sandbag, and his test came out really well. Um, but still, we didn't kind of get approval. We still were waiting and waiting. So as they say, and my mom knew that patience, in fact, is not one of my virtues. Um, the space in the middle here is not um, because of a typo. It's because between when we applied when we, and then when we got the approval and got everything done, there was about six months or so. And so that kind of made a big rush towards the end. Okay, so school also, it also meant that school was closed. And in fact, school was going to be one of the ways we were going to be able to get more information out to parents and so on about it. Um, also, summer is really important because we didn't want the involvement of the summer residents and quite a number of them, because of COVID, didn't know if they could come. Uh, I didn't even know if I could come. And then by the time it opened up a bit, uh, some people had already made alternative plans or were still too concerned because there were no vaccines. Um, the council meetings had been interrupted for COVID. So in fact, it wasn't until mid-September that we got the formal go ahead, but we had gotten going ahead before. Um, we also knew that we were getting really worried because of course the ground gets too hard to be doing some of the work that was required. Um, including moving wires and moving signs and stuff like that. Anyways, I was about to uh, give up, but uh, Pam is a great um, partner to have. And uh, she also explained to me things about, you know, um, yeah, just to, you know, chillax, as it were. Well, she didn't use that word, but okay. Okay. Now, now it won't move forward. <laughs> there we go. So uh, for this time, we had also been scoping out. And so now we got busy and we got, uh, we got together with the community. We asked the community for input um, on the wording that was going to go on the plaque. Um, Pam's going to talk more about that. One challenge we faced was that um, Matisse, and we do pronounce it Matisse, not Métis, is, um, for, there's a whole history behind that. But um, one of the challenges was that Matisse sur mer is actually split between two municipalities, I think, it's, or boroughs, between two boroughs. And one half is uh, bilingual, officially bilingual, and the other half is French. So uh, we had a situation where somebody on the Francophone side had complained about um, a number of uh, the appearance of English, and we think it may have been heritage uh, uh, signs for, event, you know, for information and events, which did have French at the top, English at the bottom. So we were worried that there might be somebody that would complain because the memorial is on the francophone side of um, uh, Matisse sur Mer. So luckily, um, sorry, we had already put our plaque in, uh, the order for the plaque in, and it's several thousand dollars. So we were worried, but luckily nothing, uh, nothing went wrong. We also found uh, local suppliers for pretty much everything, which was, was one of our goals. And this is where it gets important for us. We suspected that it wouldn't be easy to raise the money because the area itself is actually not particularly well off. Um, so we, one of the things that we thought was important was being able to get um, donations by email and that we were able to achieve um, with Pam managing that and checks going to the bill. And we also wanted to make sure that the donors could receive tax receipts. It doesn't make a difference for everybody, but for some, um, and we did have some generous donors, it, you know, it might have made it more of a difference. And luckily, because we were partnering with the Ville, um, uh, they were, we were able to get the tax receipts. So, so uh, the financing got going. And um, as I said, and we went to, we asked sponsors, we asked local businesses and so on. We asked, we connected with the, uh, with the uh, UK, the U, um, New Zealand and Australia, but unfortunately didn't immediately get some money from them. But we did hear from the British High Commission that did ultimately send a nice, uh, a nice letter. And they also provided an RAF pilot originally was going to come in person, but uh, later, uh, who was in FRB Bagotville. Uh, but he later did at least connect by Zoom with the school students, and that was very popular. As usual, there was paper, paper, paper. So we had to, there were three different documents um, 
a memorandum of understanding of maintenance, ownership certificate, um, the in-kind support from the VIL. And so we had to put all that together. And this is the other area I thank Pam. And she realized that really around this area, and I'm, I'm glad that this still exists, most things are done just basically on the, on the basis of a verbal agreement and uh, not even a handshake. Um, so I'm going to pass it back to um, Pam. <laughs> So, <laughs> on, the, on Saturday, August 22nd, 2020, the Ville de Matisse Mayor, Maris, Carol Ann Dubay, and Heritage Interim Executive Director Guy and Heritage Chairman Alexander Reford unveiled the memorial design in a mini and a mini exhibition showing the region's people of their past and continuing sacrifices for others. Barb? <laughs> I should point out that uh, the event poster on the left that you see and in the photos are people who are very important to this project. Um, there are our first responders and we'll talk about them later. There was our members of our planning committee, and in the top right, um, speaking to the, man, the decorated man, um, we see Jack Herbert. Um, the Veterans Affairs funded about half the project, so around $12,000, and so Heritage had to collect $12,000. And when I heard that the Jack Herbert Foundation had kindly agreed to match donations, my blood pressure finally dropped, ba dropped back to about as normal as it ever gets. So we have uh, great appreciation for his contribution and also for him coming and being part of that opening um, uh, design unveiling. Sorry. Now, nothing seems to work here. <laughs> Oops, Oops. Sorry. hi Barb. <laughs> okay. Hi, nice to see you. <laughs> okay, we're gonna try to share again and try. Oh, glit. Do you want to try try your keyboard? Try the uh, right arrow. If you, if you I, that's what already. I've been. I, that's what I've been trying. I've tried. Ah, oh, there. Okay, good. Finally behaved. Okay. <laughs> so, so due to COVID, the comp uh, the exhibition included arrows. You can see two red arrows. <laughs> Measure. They were measures to keep the visitors six feet apart, and we use gallons of hand sanitizer. This lasting tribute is for those who have served and are serving our country, as well as for those who supported and support people on the front lines and in disaster zones. This also includes our first responders. <laughs> this next slide, on April 24, 2020, Rita Turif, representing the Ville de Matisse Mayor Council, and Alexander Reeford as the Chair of Heritage Lower St. Lawrence, formally initiated the groundbreaking for a community monument to our heroes, those living and past. In the words of one person who contributed to the wording of the plaque to be installed on the monument, this is an honor and thank all those who gave or give their time, health, and even the lives to serve their country and community, both overseas and at home during war and in peace. <laughs> this one is, <laughs> though on the 2020 November 11th, ceremony was small due to the COVID rules that limited the attendance to 25 people. It still remained an important part of Matisse and the surrounding areas annual event. And the Matisse Beach School students, Tommy Riley read John McCrae's in Flanders Field in English and Annick Tardif read the French version. Roger Tremblay, retired Canadian Navy radio communications officer, and Mark Andre Gilbo, representing the legions and its members, laid a wreath at the base of the monument. Veterans serving armed force members and first responders were thanked for their contributions. The British High Commission in the letter expressed immense gratitude to the people of Matisse who tend and visit the graves 
of the eight Commonwealth airmen who lost their lives in training accidents at the Mosley World War II bombing school. Jack Herbert, Nicole Fournier, and Mr. Thibault, representing the Legion, presented generous donations to help finance the project. Barb. Okay, um, so for those that are watching, there's one thing you'll notice is that the, the central picture, which is just one I love, which has one of the older um, matriarchs and um, you know, historians of the area, but I just thought it was a great one, and, uh, accompanied by Lizanne Chung, who also works for Heritage at this point, and um, was also very much part of helping us um, get the whole project uh, and the physical part of the project with the, with the bags and uh, with the sandbags and so on uh, put together. I also wanted to point out, although it's not a great picture here, that down on the the bottom right in light blue, um, Nicole Fournier was also a major donor. And when Pam received one of the periodic reports from the Ville about the checks that had recently been received, she kind of ran over to say to the clerk, there must be an error here by at least one zero. Please, could you check into it? But no, uh, Nicole not only put us up to, to our goal after Jack's great start, but beyond it. And her donations allowed us to commission two three person seats um, from a local um, woodworker. And so at the monument coming as of this summer, you'll be able to sit there and, and uh, take in the peaceful area. Um, and then for uh, older people that join us for the uh, Remembrance Day ceremony, in the, they, they'll be a place for people to stay. Okay, back to you, Pam. So <laughs> the next slide. going to get to the next slide. <laughs> this slide is uh, the Heritage VAC team had called for community ideas for the plaque to be placed on the community monument. Ten people, men and women, vets and non-men, vets, francophones and anglophones, permanent and summer residents from age 27 to over age 70 provided proposals has each brought out an important point or thought in what they wrote. The team wanted to ensure that the spirit of each was included in some way in the project. Anything that could not be included in some fashion on the plaque due to space limited was used on online memorial or in speeches, etc. The stone is granite with a dedication plaque placed on it, and there is a deep red poppy at the top of the stone. The granite stone is between two memory walls of concrete, sandbags representing the trenches of past wars. Roger Trombley, like many armed force members, has filled his share of sandbags, and he said that the uneven rough nature of the sandbags is an appropriate representation of the harshness of war and disaster. The plaque reads, to remember is to honor, keep the flame alive. May the torch pursue its ways through the ages to honor the heroes in our community who have served and are still serving on land and sea and in the air. Thank you for your courage, commitment and sacrifices for our freedom and security. Okay, uh, on November 11th, we also uh, launched a virtual memorial. And an online, this was an online memorial, had been part of our plan, but it, it ended up uh, getting much, much bigger along the way. Um, and as we asked for donations for the memorial, we also asked for photos and stories and, and so on. And the response was great. Um, in fact, we still haven't finished putting everything up on the website yet, but there were some that we'll mention later on in the presentation. Now, uh, the virtual memorial was not without its challenges. Like uh, many other smaller associations, the website was always going to be being updated. And then this was delayed for good reasons until the end. So we did a lot of the design and uploading work ourselves. Um, we learned how 
French accents can cause webmasters endless headaches. We had staff turnover, we had vacations intervening in the summer, but people were all enthusiastic and so that, that helped to keep, keep us going. Um, the site also includes basic Canadian war history just because we're realizing that uh, younger people really don't have that knowledge, although sadly they are getting more of it uh, nowadays. Um, so we also included what children did, why animals were important and so on. And we'll meet just a few of the people, as I said, in a couple of a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, what what? So we were looking for not just images and stories, but we are also trying to get first person um, recordings. And some of them had been made during a previous previous Live Our Heritage uh, project, but they hadn't had much exper exposure on the website because it was always going to be being replaced. We also got some new ones. Um, I interviewed my uncle practicing uh, to interview other people. And he was still a boy when World War II started. So all the stories of his were amusing, except for one. Um, when he remembered an occasion in 1944 that affected quite a number of people in the area, and it related to the Black Watch. Um, the Black Watch being, uh, I guess, a regiment, and it is got its head office, I think, in uh, Canada, in Montreal. So I contacted, um, the Black Watch to see if we could figure out what the event was that my uncle remembers and we got back an almost immediate response. So quoting his email, the month would have been August and the date of the battle was the 25th of uh, 1944. The battle took place at Verrier Ridge. The Black Watch Regiment was annihilated with a casualty rate of 90%, which includes killed, wounded or captured. From a separate source, again, totally coincidentally, we heard from somebody who had spent summers in Matisse, a man by the name of John Cowan, and his father was in the war. He wrote, Sundays in Matisse began with church services. The few shops and post office were closed as was, except for a few afternoon hours, the telegraph office. So it was unusual on that summer Sunday to see the telegraph boy on his bicycle before noon, and then to see the telegraph opus open after church. It's unknown how many, we regret to inform you, messages were delivered that day. Reports from the Department of War of the missing, wounded, and killed continued to come in through the day. From our cottage veranda, that's from um, John Cowan's veranda, and his father was in the war, uh, we could see the messenger boy bicycling down the road, and each time he passed our gate without turning in, we breathed a thankful sigh. At last in the evening, the messages ceased, and it is said that someone passing the telegraph office noticed the young boy sitting on the steps, his head in his hands, weeping. To off this, offset this story, which never fails to shake me, give me goosebumps, there were also other recordings that were amusing, as such if you've had a chance to read some of these. Dancing with the, uh, the, the pilots from Mangeli was, was a favorite. There's lots of you know, kids' games, too, because the kids were uh, there while their fathers usually were away at war. So, um, so here is uh, another thing that happened there. There's a woman, Lorna Bethel. So she read about, um, she talked about the efforts of the community to provide support. So women and others, um, permanent Anglophone, Francophone, all would gather in location. The Seaside Hotel was one. Um, the Cascade Golf and Tennis Club was another to do things as varied as rolling bandages, knitting, um, putting together care packages and so on. So there was, um, it obviously was a very serious and important time. Now, um, there is a, one of the interviews was what, because I, there were several parts that he talked about. One was that very sad uh, case that I mentioned earlier, but was another one was one of the big debated items was, were there spies that actually, German spies who had actually landed in the St. Lawrence? So this is a pretty active debate, but um, my uh, uncle remembered one thing, and I'm going to ask if, um, Glenn, if you could play that short clip. I should apologize, I was not expert, and I was, I'm still not expert in uh, recording, so um, the first part is my voice and it's a bit too loud. The second is the important part. The other story, which I'd heard before, but some people seem to be surprised by it, was it happened at Sunny Bay, where there was some story that there's some Germans had come ashore. Yeah, and I, John Bovey went to the war crime trials in Nuremberg. We, uh, we went to, actually went and saw his office mm -hmm. years later. 
But uh, he said that he had a Batman who was a, a German submarine who apparently had landed. He and Taylor buddies quite frequently and uh, got in the Sunny Bay Hotel for beer on the weekend. Knows. And uh, John quizzed him quite extensively about the, you know, prove it, basically, he was saying. And the fellow described the Sunny Bay Hotel in uh, precise terms. He thought it was very logical that it actually happened. So thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, for those that did not hear it clearly enough, it was uh, about, there was a, it was called the Sunny Bay Motel, but it, then it later was called, and Pam would remember this, and uh, I'm going to forget it. Um, Petite Miami. <laughs> ah, that's right. The Petite Miami. Um, and so it was a, a bar, a, a fantastic dance place with a, a dance floor that seemed to be out over the river and so on. Um, and we, we, um, so it, that place, actually, if you come to visit Matisse, as we hope you will, and try out one of our trails, uh, there's more information about that particular spot. Um, I, okay, we also received uh, pictures and written recollections and so on, and I'm just going to talk touch upon a, just a few. Um, one was about, the one of the early ones that Pam received uh, was Guy Leonard Massé, um, and so we've, he's a little bit more of the backstory of him and his uh, photos are now on the website and that we will include that. I've got the, um, the link to the website at the end of this. So you could go and vis visit some of these people. Um, we had Frank Cobbett who, um, was a musician, but also, uh, in, in the, um, battle of the St. Lawrence stationed in Halifax. We had Albert Moisard who is the, um, I believe it's the aunt uh, of one of the women working at Michelin Williams, who's working at Heritage at the moment. And he was um, in the Veterans Guard, which was something that w is what we called the Home Guard. Um, there was jo Douglas uh, Johnson, who was a Japanese internee. Um, with, there was Vieter Villemaire, who is a, uh, who is a, um, the father of, uh, sorry, the father of Michelin Williams, unless I got that wrong, which I probably will, and Michelin will correct me later. Um, and he was a uh, in the food service provision. So we're we're kind of think about. I'm sorry, this is the picture of him. I believe his name is Vic here. Um, we have Elspeth Russell. So she was somebody that I hadn't heard of before, and she was from Matan, and she ferried planes to England. Um, an amazing job and. To link to the next one, where there are about six Matisse war brides in Matisse, but there's also a war groom, um, and that was Elspeth Russell brought back uh, her husband with him. And um, we also had um, Clifford Powell, so he's the bottom right hand corner, and he looks very young, doesn't he? Well, it's he was because he signed up um, when he was only 16, and he told the um, uh, he had actually sort of altered his birth year to be two years later, so it looked like he was 18. He went off to England, he got a promotion, seems like he got another promotion, and then they discovered that he was really younger, so they demoted him and they took away his increase in salary, which seems a little bit fair. And on top of that, they also said that he couldn't get the money directly, it would have to be sent home to his mother. Um, I don't think that that ever changed. He never got back his uh, his uh, title, sorry, his um, rank, and he never got paid the extra money. Um, and then the last one, and we're going to talk a little about this gentleman later. We had Ron de la, uh, Ron, Ronald de la Ronde who landed on the beaches of France, and we'll cover him a bit more later. Okay, so... Um, and just as they say that, you know, no good deed goes unpunished, we had to actually do that after we were exhausted and this had been launched and so on, we still had to do, and of course it's important for our government to, we had to do a final report to show that there was um, value for the money that the government had given us on your behalf, your behalf being of you taxpayers. Um, so the first reaction was uh, we survived. <laughs> uh, the secondly, we went... Um, we wanted the one of the goals because you have to set these goals first. We wanted the monument to be in a centrally regular, uh, sorry, uh, centrally in a regularly visited location, 
So it is going to be a place along the trails, but it is also the place you go to pick up your, you know, when um, uh, recycling gets put out and stuff, and it'll be in future the part of future Remembrance Day events. So that was positive. We also wanted to instill community pride in remembrance of the past by all community members. And in this, we think we have achieved it well, and Pam continues to get more names and so on to add to the list. Um, and those are, that, for example, um, over 18 years, Pam had built a database of 171 veterans with local connections. 104 surfaced during our project, which is a 61% increase. And in fact, uh, there's another uh, 11, I think, that have been added since that. So I think we're up to 286. Um, and also, she received a number more from Price this year that we're going to be adding in as well. So we think that these are the types of things that kind of built our knowledge of, but it also brought together the two linguistic communities because without a doubt, um, there were huge sacrifices made by men and women in the past. Um, and both sides, they gave financially, they both provided words for the plaques, uh, they both provided, you know, names, photos and information um, about English and French veterans and serving people. And there was one gentleman, uh, for those of you that are particularly interested in air, uh, the air service and the, um, the British, um, I always forget the BCATP, the uh, flight training school near Montjoly. Um, there was somebody that manages a website uh, of that, which is very, very interesting. Anyways, he was taken by our interest so that he volunteered to translate into, fr into French, sorry, into um, English for free, a 5,000 word document. Um, and that's something that you can also kind of visit um, on our website or on his. We also received more media coverage on this project than on any other heritage project. So that was kind of gratifying as well. Um, and still to come, we've still got to put out the benches that have now been built and uh, lacquered. And we also put out the plaques um, for our, uh, a couple of plaques there for especially for uh, there are some servicemen not just, sorry, for the servicemen um, it, that are the airmen, the foreign airmen, but also in recognition of the fact that there are some people from the area who have, who have lost family members who are buried overseas. Okay. Now, I, I said um, that we'd come back to one gentleman. Um, and as we end, when researching for the project on the VAC website, uh, we saw the words, veterans want Canadians to understand the price of freedom. They're passing the torch to the people of Canada, so the memory of their sacrifices will continue, and the values they fought for will live on in all of us. This uh, echoed what Pam had said early on, that veterans are worried that uh, schools don't teach uh, World War history anymore. And so in November, the veterans appreciate the fact that uh, knowledge of their sacrifices is continuing. One thing I didn't... Uh, the, the potential loss of memory is uh, worrisome, and I, I don't, don't know whether some of you know, but um, there is in Juneau Beach, there's a big a Canadian memorial, and um, at the moment, uh, there are condos that are apparently going to be being built up there. Uh, for those of you who have a concern, there is a petition that you can sign. And now to link I said earlier. So one of the latest the, uh, recollections that we've added to the website are those of uh, Mr. Ronald de Ronde, who landed on a beach in Courcelles in northern France, and it was either at or near Juneau Beach, and he served along the coast in France and in Belgium and in the Netherlands. He talks about a young boy he gave a chocolate bar to, and who later then give, gave him a, a lucky coin, a gilder. His family still has it. Uh, he talked about a German who spoke English quite well that he gave a lift to, because you never know <laughs> what's going to be happening. He talked about their mascot, which was a duck. Um, and that's one of the things we've learned is just how important these small animals can be to the morale of obviously soldiers over there. And he spoke of the fact that five of the 12 men he enlisted with never made it home. It is going to be Mr. De Laurent's 100th birthday later this year. So those of you able to do it, feel free to put a happy birthday um, it, into the chat, uh, because I believe he's got family members who may be able to see it. Now, rather than saying things are, things were sad, things were interesting, 
but there are, were also some funny things. So um, Pam had uh, a photo of Roger Tremblay. Um, he's the gentleman on the left and on the, of the cartoons and then on the right of the image uh, at the, the photo. Um, so Pam had a photo of Roger and she thought that he reminded her of Captain Haddock in the Tintin stories. And luckily Roger was a good sport. Uh, he helped us all along the way. Okay, and almost done. We wanted to give our, our, our great thanks to um, a number of the people that have been uh, with us, some of whom I think are on the uh, um, call now. Uh, so first of all, to Veterans Affairs Canada and to Patrimoine Canadien, uh, Patrimoine Canada, Canada Heritage, uh, that both funded uh, some parts of, of the project. To Roger Tremblay and Marc-André Gulbeau, who were, again, through with Pam throughout and great helps throughout. Um, to Caroline Dubé, who was the mayoress at the time, and she didn't give up, uh, through COVID especially. To Jack Herbert and to uh, Nicole Fournier, who really made such a difference um, and enabled us to do more than we ever would have expected. We also wanted to thank uh, Ted Savage, Annie Le Cavalier, and the first responders who were at all events without, you know, getting paid for it. Also, Alexander Reeford, Michelin, Michelin Williams, Lisa Chung, and Heritage Board and staff who uh, approved us as we were kind of going along. Everybody who contributed, whether money or photos or um, any uh, their recordings and so on, their time. And then last but not least, uh, the veterans at the three legions of uh, Rimouski, Matan, and um, Montjoly. And it was, uh, to ha it was a very happy note when we found out earlier this year that the Royal Canadian Legion, the, uh, the, pl the plaque that you can see on the right, recognized Pam this year for her unending efforts and her dedication to make sure that we never forget. So that was kind of the icing on the, on the top of the cake. And so to conclude, please visit us in Matisse and to find the, um, the virtual memorial and play th go through that. It's a heritage lsl.ca commemoration dash remembrance. Um, and if you have any questions, we'd be pleased to answer them. Barb and Pam, what a wonderful presentation and such an amazing project. I'm so impressed and I have a few questions for you. But before I get started, I'll just invite Glenn to come in so we can tell everybody how they can ask questions too. Everyone, yes, thanks, uh, Barb and Pam, great job. So for any of you with us on Zoom, if you have any questions, um, the easiest way is the chat box in Zoom. It's down at the bottom of the screen, um, as, you, as you might remember. Um, you can either just say that you have a question and then um, you can start your video and we'll queue you up and turn on your mic and introduce you and you can ask your question. Or if you're a little camera shy, you can type your question in the chat box and Heather or myself will relay it to our speakers on your behalf. Um, similarly, if you're on Facebook, just leave your question in the comments. I will do my best to check in there and um, and relay your question on, on uh, uh, to our two speakers. So Heather, I'm sure you have a question or two. I do. I'm just so impressed how you managed to get the word out and get people excited during COVID about this project. <laughs> and I'm just wondering if you could just tell me how you did it, because I think a lot of community groups struggle right at the beginning of getting, they, they may be excited themselves, but getting the community on board is so important as you as you've told us how you know everybody from the hardware store to uh, you know people down the street are on board but how did you do it and when everybody was sitting at home locked inside and you got people excited and dreaming along with with you Pam too well I can answer that um, <laughs> I do know a lot of people here and so I would you know it's kind of talk to them, would they be interested? Do you think it's an interesting project? I've kind of brought them on board so that they had the input to let us know how they would like something, et cetera, et cetera. So I call it, I go around here and I say, I work at ground level. <laughs> I work yep. with the people and that's that's basically how it's how we went about it. It makes sense, you know, one person at a time getting the word out and knocking on the doors. It's hard work at first, isn't it, to 
to really grow that dream, that project idea. One other thing I should call out is that uh, the heritage people, the heritage employees, and again, and sometimes the the voluntold, so that would be uh, Michelin and um, uh, Lisanne Chung, they came together early to try to, okay, what are we going to do? Because we need to help, especially it's winter and it's COVID. So uh, they came uh, they came up with virtual teas. So there where people could kind of Zoom and uh, talk. And there was, uh, there was presentation about the Live Our Heritage project and about this particular, the memorial project, because they were, they were separate, but, but interconnected. Um, so that was, I think, helpful um, because yeah, I, yeah, we were we were worried. Yeah, no, it's it's really impressive, and uh, I mean, you're currently still growing the memorial, uh, virtual memorial, and I think that is an amazing idea to attach to the stone monument because a lot of people would have stopped at the monument, but you've you made it something so much more impressive and interconnected with the community and. And I just wondered how you're, you're keeping the, are you, are you still looking for funding to keep that part of the project going? <laughs> Not really the funding part, but the information part. Um, <laughs> since uh, I work in the heritage office with the historical section, I believe it will always be an ongoing uh, project. <laughs> it will always be added to. But then most history is. History is always ongoing, whether it was yesterday or 200 years ago. So that's yeah. that's how I see it. So. And I agree. The one thing was um, we have, you know, lost uh, people in the community. And I, for any other organization, um, like such as, well, any other uh, organization, um, I think it's so important to start at least capturing the oral histories and the photos early enough because we did lose an unusual number of real community leaders in the last while. Um, and also, um, I don't know if one of the people is on this call, but at one point, um, there, there's always one person in the family that is, you know, more into history and doing all the paper keeping. Well, anyway, so when somebody dies, there are people that will try to um, uh, think, uh, I've just noticed a note which I'll mention in a minute. Um, uh, so, um, they, that, that they are overwhelmed with all of the paper and the stuff they have to deal with of the person who has died, that they may just toss out a lot of, um, material. And a lot of it is so, oh, it means so, so much, um, so I think, you know, find out which person in your family likes doing this stuff and make sure they get it or pass it on. And I've got to say recently as well, I believe there was another person in Matisse, I think it was a Mrs. Price, who had done a lot of research about the soldier, uh, trying to find out about the uh, airmen and uh, that's gone to, or it, it's either already gone to or it's coming to heritage. Um, I, we saw that um, Marie-Claude Giroux who also is working, uh, worked at Heritage, sorry, works at Heritage. And she, I've, um, I, I, I'm very wrong to have forgotten her because she had to do, <laughs> she had to do a lot of, she just does the work on the um, municipal newsletter, which is, uh, includes a lot of the of our heritage stuff. So we were trying to include little bits about history and so on in every event. And I have to thank her for allowing me to be late with my contributions quite a few times, but. Uh... Very good. I wonder too, uh, I mean, I when I was a student, I used to work at the uh, Colonel John McRae Birthplace Museum in Guelph, Ontario. So uh, I love the glass poppy, gorgeous. But I wondered if you, if you connect to other uh, museums and uh, historical sites that, that share the history of of veterans and soldiers and the war in, in their own communities around the gas bay, perhaps even? I have to say yes. <laughs> yes, we, we've also worked with um, one of the members of the museum in the gas bay. He actually came up to one of our, uh, he was spying actually on our way of doing <laughs> our Remembrance Week. 
and he told me that uh, I'd given him some great ideas for your well for the museum down down on the other side of us. So yeah, no, no, we we connect with with a lot of uh, <laughs> everywhere everywhere we can. So yeah, no, that's excellent because sharing the stories helps keep that memory alive and uh, yes. and understanding that price of freedom, as you said, it's so important. And I was sorry to hear about what's happening at Juno Beach. And I wondered if we can find the link on your website or is, is the go to the Juno, Juno Beach uh, Foundation perhaps to see what we can do to help. Actually, I will, um, actually, because we have, you have a great guest that I think Glenn is going to introduce and I will okay. look for that link while he is being introduced. Very and good. Sandra, um, and uh, I think I just, uh, let's see, Sandra, I unmuted your mic. Um, so come on there, I see your videos on too. Yeah, my, my parents just took their midi video off, but my parents, including my father, who is who we were talking about, Ron de la Ronde, I don't know what happened to his video. They oh, were just I, just, gone. I just sent him a message to start his video. Uh, okay. Ron, you should have you should have got that message. I'll send another one. And then if not, I'm going to unmute you. So, Ron, we can hear you even if we can't see you. They want to know if you want to be on the video. Sorry, uh, no. <laughs> okay, just 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 leave your video off. No problem. No. So, Dad, I'm just introducing you to everybody. Karen's on. You know Pam. I think you know Barb Amston. Uh, yes, I don't yes. know if you've met Michelin Williams. You know Jill Harrington and the other ladies. I'm sorry. I probably know you by face, but um, they just wanted to say hi. And I think there's already some birthday messages in there for you. Yeah, I've told him that. He's okay. tired. He's tired of sitting. <laughs> okay. Well, happy birthday to you, Mr. Delaron, yes. and thank you so much for your thank service you. and uh, keeping Canada safe in what it what was a terrible time. <laughs> and I've got the gilder, Dad. I showed it in the picture. Show it again. Have you got it, Sandra? Yeah. Sandra's going to show your gilder. Oh. So this is the gilder that's in the story that he got from the little boy for giving chocolate. And That's he's had wild. it ever since then. And uh, I was out there two years ago and he asked me if I would now take care of it. So it's That's pretty cool. It's so wonderful. That is beautiful. It's been your good luck charm. <laughs> Right, uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you very much for introducing your dad to us and uh, and your mom, too. Thank you for being with us. It, 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 this makes this even more special than it already has been. I'm just delighted. Oh, there they are. Hello. <laughs> That's great. Welcome to um, you both. Yeah, Sandra, I'm going to just uh, I'm, I'm going to mute you now. I did see a question on Facebook. Let me hop over there and read it. Just give me a moment. Um, this was from Nancy Beatty. And she wanted to know, she says, congratulations on a tremendous project and interesting presentation. What key advice would you give to any other community or entity looking to embark on a memorial project? <laughs> well, perseverance, that's number one. <laughs> it, uh, it certainly is mind boggling when you have to start the paperwork. I was so glad that Barb came on board for that part of it. I guess I never really thanked you, Barb, for that. Thank you. <laughs> we, we, we thank each other mutually. Um, it, I do think um, there were parts of it that were a lot easier than, well, I, getting the information from individuals about their people, their families and friends, like that was, that was actually, um, not too hard and and sometimes because I we would take anything like a, an email you know somebody just talking and I would type it up and so on um but th the one thing I would say is that there are it, it could be the process could be made a bit easier 
Um, and I'd be, I think we'd both be more than pleased if somebody is serious about this, that we can kind of go over and we can talk to them about the, um, um, uh, thanks, Jill. <laughs> uh, we can go over some of the things, you know, the more detailed things that we learned. Um, the Because except for the, like the virtual memorial also, I realized it, it could almost have started maybe, you know, first to get people really interested and that might have made it easier to collect money to start with but um i we'd be pleased to talk to anybody that is thinking about doing something like this because yeah sharing sharing misery is what we do best right yeah that's that's wonderful and i'm sure that for those people that will watch this later on uh heritage talks facebook page that's great because uh, I, I and I just noticed too when you were speaking that you seem to have very specific goals at the beginning and I think that's really where you start is making sure you know the direction you're going in and the steps you're going to take and you seemed so organized with that right at the start maybe you didn't feel it when you were doing it in the process of everything with all the papers fluttering in and and government uh, applications and that sort of thing are, are tend to be very complicated sometimes but you kept your eye on the goals and uh, that's uh, probably why you have this amazing monument and so and such a beautiful one too not anything that's very typical that you see you know it's the sandbag idea and the beautiful poppy just fantastic the one other thing I would mention was, so we, the actual the goals were relatively straightforward because Pam every year makes an application for funding. I think it's, it can be between five and $750 for Remembrance Day celebrations. It's also a federal government one and they all, and the federal government does a good job of giving a whole bunch of different things that can be used for activities. So for anybody interested, they could start with that and then, you know, then move up. Yeah, and in my experience too, the, the representatives at the federal level are very helpful uh, in get going through the paperwork and offering suggestions even before you submit a proposal. So it's always a great idea to contact them directly, any funders actually, if it's a foundation or at the government level, have a conversation with people, pick up the phone and start that way too. It really is very helpful. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I've, I That was the kind of, I, I sort of, we thanked uh, VAC, as we call it, Veterans Affairs and PCH, but really the people, their people were positive and did, you know, say, you know, we need something here or there. And they kept it simple because it, you know, parts of the, f yeah, it, we just, they just, they know that they're dealing with often with smaller groups with not that many resources. So that was really positive. Yeah. Well, I don't see any other questions. I don't think Glenn has any others coming in from from Facebook. So I'll bring our afternoon to a close. Um, but I just want to thank you again so much for telling us about an amazing project. I'm so impressed. And I'm sure everybody else that will tune into this or who is here with us right now uh, is also impressed. You took it way beyond something that was just a, a memorial. It's a living remembering. It's rem remembrance of people that that gave their lives and still serving for Canada. And to have someone like uh, that, our, our gentleman, Mr. Deleron, come on with his wife, just fantastic. And thank you, Sandra, for introducing him as well. Uh, so Glenn, I think we'll, we'll take it to an end now. Thank you for your help and master control. Uh, for those of you that are interested, we have another talk coming up on Thursday. It's a quick one coming up by Julie Miller and Francois Ra from the Centre for Access to Services in English in the Maurice and Centre du Quebec. Thursday at seven o'clock, their talk is called From Burton to Barton, 250 Years of Anglo Anglophone Presence in Trois-Rivières. And they have a project that is, is quite remarkable too. So an interesting in project here and over in uh, at the Centre of Quebec. So thank you very much, everybody, for being part of Heritage Talks Online today. And until next time, we'll see you then and have a good afternoon. Bye for now. <laughs> so... I just want to say thank you to Sandra and also so happy to to uh, 
see Kay and uh, and Ron. Ron Delorone, I'm sorry that we talk so much because you're right, sitting could be very long. <laughs> Ed, <laughs> Michelin, I, if Michelin is there with, um, um, uh, with uh, Jack and uh, uh, his lovely wife. I, that's great for them as well. Bye. Terry, sorry, Terry.